All right, so this is the pre-class video for our PH 140 World Philosophies, class number 17 for Wednesday, July 28th. Um, and it's the second day on Buddhism. Um, so uh, I'm, you're gonna be watching these two pre-class videos together. So I'll, I'll just start, pick up from where I left off. There's, again, I like to think systematically. Uh, philosophy is about thinking systematically. It's about recognizing patterns. So this is, I take one religion, Buddhism, and I write, send you a bunch of articles, but each one of them represents a pattern that can be true in any religion. Um, and so you can think, is Christianity like that? Is Hinduism like that? What about Socrates and his unexamined life? Or what about Aristotle, Socrates, the whole Greek ethos? Um, so, and then what about me? What about my background? How does my background fit into all these patterns? How about where I want to go? Like, what direction do I want to head? Uh, so you have what you had before you came to college, you get your mind blown during college, and then you have, uh, when you graduate, you start forming an idea, but hopefully you're just constantly keeping an open mind and growing as much as you can. Um, so in the last assignment um, for Tuesday, I talked about the outline, I talked about Jesus and Buddha, Buddha's confrontation with the Brahmins, um, Jesus, and then the temptation story of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, how that compares to Buddha. They both in their late 20s had this revelation. Um, all right, and then um, the fact that Westerners acknowledge that Buddhist meditation actually has a calming effect on the brain. And then Buddhism and human rights, that Buddhism has been egalitarian, way more so than a lot of other religions. Um, so the assignment for Wednesday, the new material is um, there's just an outline on Buddhism and the environment, which again, it shouldn't surprise you. Um, I teach environmental ethics and that's where I actually assign the article. Then I have a uh, paper written by a student, it's not very long, so there's a lot of readings here, but none of them are very long, where he compares Buddha with Proverbs. Uh, again, to just sort of, I emphasize the similarities not the differences. And then the Old Testament, the New Testament, um, there's so much more material you could use, but this was a good paper. The, the young man who wrote it eventually got a degree in computer science and he actually taught at Lyon, um, Mr. Davis. And it was great. He came and talked in my World Philosophies class about his experience at Lyon. And he had a conversion experience. Um, he is now an Episcopal priest as well as a computer science guy. And I don't know, he's got three kids, and crazy. But he got another job he couldn't refuse in computer science, I think. So he went and his family was in Little Rock with other relatives and it was just too hard. But the point is, you can learn stuff that you can still remember or that your professor still remembers your papers. And that's what having a small liberal arts school is about. Um, Seeking Christian Interiority is an article by a, a prominent theologians at the time, at the time. And it does bring up some themes about how do we practice Christianity today? And he just says the culture is very distracting and capitalist and all this stuff. So you have to seek interiority. You have to find it inside yourself. Um, and a lot of my students really like 
this article. So um, I hope you like it. Then um, the Buddhism and women, you have your book. And I want you to read the chapter on Buddhism and human rights. And again, you can imagine Buddha himself was very progressive. He said that women could achieve liberation. It's just, ah, that was way out there, way out there. But just like with Hinduism, just like with Christianity, just like with, you know, the people who came later wrote, you know, doctrine or stories that um, distorted. They, they brought in their own agendas. Some of it might have been well-intentioned, but what they remembered about Jesus wouldn't be what somebody else remembered, which is partly why we have four gospels. Um, but also they have agendas, just like remember the Hindu, the code of Manu, my goodness, that has nothing to do with energy. So Gandhi, you know, his idea of truth force and his activism, nonviolent, to stay in touch with the Atman. What on earth does that have to do with, okay, you have to let your husband beat you and all this? So that happens. I mean, it's funny, sort of, because you can see it in some other religion. But I'm telling you, you know, the same things happened in Christianity. So how do you deal with it in your tradition, right? So we will, we will go through this. Um, and there's just lots of themes here that we'll go through. The relation between class and religion. The Brahmins were the privileged class. Um, one thing about America was founded by people from the privileged class, Church of England, but they allowed in people from every class. And so um, the Puritans, the people from other religions, some of them were more educated, but most of them were less educated, but that was okay with their founders as long as you religions over here citizenship is over here um and the religion and globalization of course is just a big deal and this book is quite old but it the same patterns that's what i want to teach right it's not like like yesterday some great new pattern emerged a lot of it is that um it just is going at a faster speed and with covid Everybody is becoming that much more aware of these patterns <clears throat> and the way that the developing countries are not getting vaccines and the developed countries are able to move on. So, so much about it might split the rich and the poor within countries, between countries. Um, and... Um, then there is this problem of money, problem of greed, which we brought up with the, the Greeks, uh, the problem of prostitution. That's, that's an issue in every society. It's part of the problem of sexism. Um, so then I also have the, this book, The Wisdom of the Buddha. It's just sort of um, sayings, you know, uh, kind of like Confucius Analects, kind of like the Proverbs. And um, so it's things for you to think about, reflect on. Um, and and um, there are just a lot of um, quotes here that correspond to the artworks, okay? Um, as the wind throws down a weak tree. So they make analogies between your inner life and the, the natural world outside. Um, so let me look at, ah, this is a good one. So as the rain breaks through an ill-thatched house, passion will break through an unreflecting mind. As rain does not break through a well-thatched house, passion will not break through a well-reflecting mind. So in the pictures of the Zen Buddhist pictures, there are thatched houses. Ah, oh, 
<laughs> right? There's a thatched house. Ah, so, you know, the people are thinking of those, I would say poetry, I would call it poetry. It's certainly not a doctrine. It's, it's poetry, it's stories, um, stories that have these deeper meanings. Um, so it's not just the storytelling. It's, I would, I don't know. I don't know what else to call it, but poetry. Um, there's a thatched roof, right? Then we go back to, um, maybe I'll pick a couple more. Um, but that's what I usually do in class. And if I have time, I'll do it because I think it's really fun. Um, oops. Okay, so then the next chapter, oh yeah, an island. By rousing himself by earnestness, by restraint and control, the wise man may make for himself an island. So it's an island in your mind, right? It's, but the painting is the physical island, but of course it's supposed to reflect the psychological. And um, this was something I absolutely loved about the Greeks, is that your mind is a microcosm in the macrocosm. And so much of the language is that trying to get a correspondence between what's in here and what's out there. So I became an, an environmentalist way back in high school, and I wanted to teach myself to think about what's really important is climate change. What's really important is to get the culture to integrate with nature. I, that was just my thing in high school. But when I went to college, I couldn't find any discipline that would, you know, that talked about that. But finally, you know, I transferred schools, I quit school, transferred schools. Um, I did find the Greeks, but very few Greek scholars read it this way, which is extremely disappointing because it's so important. And the West is the worst at undermining nature because of our enlightenment thinking. But the ancient wisdom tradition in the West integrates culture and nature. But apart from that, Buddhism and Hinduism really do, right? And Confucianism does more than the West with the great harmony. But this is, you know, I love art like this. Um, you make for yourself an island. So you see a picture of an island and you think, ah, that's, that's the person. And then he says, um, he, the wise person, climbs the terraced heights of wisdom, looks down on the fools, free from sorrow, he looks upon the sorrowing crowd, as one that stands on a mountain, looks down upon that that stands in the plain. So there's a number of pictures um, that has that, that have the point of view of the mountain. Um, this one is, again, integration of culture and nature. Um, I think you can't see it, but anyway, there, the, the person's body is the shape of the surroundings, um, obviously. So um, let's see, I guess, all right. And then I have some more, which I guess I'll post for class tomorrow uh, because I do love these a lot. It is good to tame the mind, which is difficult to hold in and flighty, but a tamed mind brings happiness. Um, and Houston Smith talks about how we can hardly keep our minds on one subject for more than how many seconds, but wow, that was before uh, internet and social media, I just, People don't even read anymore. I mean, you should read, okay? <laughs> you should block everything out and read for hours to just get your mind attached to another way of looking at the world. And you have to do it long enough so that you'll remember that. It'll expand your mind. Um, so this class has a lot of assignments that are shorter, you know, 15 pages. So 
that one way to um, educate your mind, right, to become an educated person would be to take one book and take a weekend, if you can, right, or big chunks of time and read big chunks of that book so that all you're thinking about is this one thesis or claim. And you can say, okay, now that's part of my worldview. But this class is trying to say, okay, here are these pieces, and this is the way Dr. Beck is putting them together to make a worldview. But each of you has to put the pieces together. But you put them together, right? It's in the putting together that you start developing your mind, your capacity for reflection. Um, so I, I look forward to this. Um, I don't want to make this a particularly long uh, video because it's just we are going to try to cover many different points about Buddhism in one class. It'll probably bleed into the, the first half of the next class, but every single theme of every reading is a theme connected to the human condition connected to all the other wisdom traditions? And then what is it about our society that threw out the wisdom traditions and decided we could create a whole culture based on just knowledge? Um, and so what are the advantages and the disadvantages of doing that? Um, yeah, so I will see you tomorrow and uh, I hope you're getting through it all. All right. Last time on the video, I said you need to make appointments and tell me your plan for doing the work. Um, I will not have office hours tonight, but I will starting um, after that. <laughs> tonight is my last class time from 9 to 12.